I mean, Washington Post, you must know about the split between Islamic State and Jabhat Nasr. Yeah. yeah. So it was exactly around this time. So we didn't know what was going on. We met Muhammad, we spoke to him, and the area that he was in used to have a lot of Jabhat Nasr, you could say, uh, uh, checkpoints and Maqarrat, uh, Madafat, like just places of sleeping and bases. It's not a base, this is a house where the best word would be like a base. They all flipped and turned IS. So it was like, okay, we're in an area that's dominated by IS, so we'll just stay here and be part of them, be with them. If it would have been dominated by Njib al maybe it would have been with JN, but we just, by default, ended up with IS. Me personally, I, nobody ever put their hand in my hand and took any pledge of allegiance from me. Uh, but the general thing was new people coming to join would have to do that. But people who were in Syria before, like their reasons for being there and their ideology wasn't really questioned. It was just like, yeah, just they were trying to win people. They were trying to bring people to them. Someone's coming to them is different to someone they're trying to keep with them. So it was at least be with us and don't be with the other groups. And they wouldn't pressure you for like pledging allegiance or anything what like that. What job did they give you? I mean, they didn't give me any job in the beginning. There was no jobs in the beginning. It was just, there was old uh, sentry positions that were covered by JN that now had to be covered by Islamic State in front of the Islamic race, in front of the Syrian regime uh, in different areas. Uh, that was mainly what they were f focusing on just replacing the old Jabhat Nusra positions with IS fighters because Jabhat Nusra kind of just withdrew from a lot of places, left a lot of, say, like uh, gaps. Uh, Muhammad, you and Alex um, became part of what section within ISIS? There was no sections at that time. No media section? There was no sections at all at that time. It was just it was uh, an organized chaos. Organized chaos, but later, if we move a bit forward? If we move forward to 2014. Yes, what happened there? Uh, it was establishment of the... The caliphate. Yeah. Maybe the, the months following the establishment of the caliphate, a lot of changes happened. There was like a structurization of what the Islamic State was. Everything was split into sections and... Uh, when we go back to Idlib, Muhammad was, I don't know who he knew, but he was, uh, he was a very loved individual in the area. The people used to call him the prince as a joke, because he was like, just always had a, it was like he had people behind him, like you couldn't touch him, you know. Yeah. Uh, he was very charismatic and very, uh, Social, so sociable, I think the words. I'm losing the English, so forgive me, I'm, I'm forgetting English. Um, so by the time we got, because we was with him, and obviously we're missing out the parts who was involved in some of the stuff that Hamid was involved in. By the time 2014 came, we were just affiliated with him. Mm -hmm. We are just with Muhammad. It wasn't like, I'm part of this diwan, or part of this mafsal, or part of this thing. Yeah, it's a pretty confusing story, but I don't know if you had the time to... So Muhammad was... Okay, then Muhammad became part of what within the Islamic State? I don't know what he was part of, but he was just linked to people in the hierarchy of Islamic State. He was being used for, for things. For what things? Uh, things that are apparent, that videos that happened, and things from before that. Most of it, I don't know, but they don't give like a, a position or like respect to people that they don't use, you know, like uh, things like he would always just have a car and if his car broke down, he would go somewhere and just have a new car. No one else had that 
well, not no one else, but no one else on our level and people that we used to affiliate with had that. A lot of the people in like these spaces, these houses, they just have like one motorbike between 30 guys and that's how they had to deal with all of their things. I had my own money, mm -hmm. bought our own cars and had our own things. But did, you, did you see, because it is clear that Muhammad, as we all know from the videos, dealt also with uh, foreign prisoners. Yeah. Did you see any of those foreign prisoners? Yeah. Who did you see? Uh, all of them. So you interacted with them as well? Hmm? You interacted with the foreign prisoners? No, correct, yeah. Can you tell us in what way you interacted with them? Uh, what was your job? Mohammed uh, asked me to get emails and details about their uh, family contacts, work contacts, anything that's relevant like that and pass them over to him. Yeah. How would you get those emails and those information? I would just go to the place where they were being detained and just ask them. Obviously, Mohammed had arranged all of the security. I don't want to call it clearances and talk like, like CIA or anything, but just you couldn't just walk into the place where people like that were detained unless you had some paper or something that gave you that permission or someone previously had told them so-and-so would come here and he's allowed to speak to these people. So how often and who did you interact with? Uh, most of them, all of them. Can you name really. them please? Because just oh, the famous ones, the known, the known ones, uh, James Foley, uh, John Cantley, uh, uh, Peter, I forgot his surname, uh, Alan, um, David, the main the ones who were in the videos. And the ones who the people didn't see, like in the media, the ones who actually, the Islamic State negotiated their release with whoever. Yeah. For example? In Denmark, uh, Daniel, uh, French uh, old man called uh, Dida, Didi, 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 am I saying it right? Didi. Others as well, yeah, but I just don't, I'm not good with the names. So the European names are very hard to... Have you ever interrogated uh, women as well, female prisoners of ISIS? I wouldn't call that interrogation, it's just more like just taking an email. It wasn't like, it was just on the one side of a door and the other side of a door. What's your email address? What's the email address of your brother? How many brothers any, do you have? Any female prisoners? You yeah, there was, uh, there was the Kayla Mueller. American. Yes, the American lady. Did those people, what did they tell you? He told me their email addresses. And you didn't speak to them about anything else? Um, not really. I didn't. Not really, no. Kayla, I just asked her how long you've been here. Because I didn't know that there was a woman. But he told me, you go, you get emails from everybody. So the one of the guards told me there's also a woman here. You have to take her email as well. She was in another place. So I went to her and said, how long have you been here? I don't know how long she, I can't remember now. Yeah. Did you, um, how did you feel about all these prisoners? At the time? Yes. Journalists, aid workers. Yeah. Um, yeah, something you have to understand is the issue of uh, ascribing to Islamic ideology and Islamic law and what is commonly considered like uh, just general morals and I'm not saying Islamic law does not coincide with morals or it's immoral at all. I'm saying that there's some things that just general understanding in the world today with new things like human rights and legal rights, people can't really grasp it or understand. Uh, according to Islamic law, uh, if you're in an Islamic community and a non-believer enters that community without having one of three things, either a covenant between that community and the community,